Um, the broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, The AdWords Evolution of 2017, Top 7 Updates You Need to Know About. My name is Michelle, and I'm just here to get things started before I pass things off to our expert. So just a couple of things before we get into today's content. For those of you who are not familiar with WordStream, WordStream uh, has a, a ton of free and paid tools that can help advertisers and agencies of all sizes really optimize um, their online advertising efforts. So definitely following today's presentation, hop on to wordstream.com, check us out, tons of resources for you there. Um, a couple more logistics for you all. We will be recording today's webinar, so if you need to hop off at any time or if you want to share today's content with your team members, uh, keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, within the next 48 hours or so, you'll get an email from us with the recording as well as the slide deck. Um, and also, we definitely encourage you all to submit questions in the GoToWebinar panel. Um, submit them throughout the webinar, and we will definitely save time at the end of the presentation and get to as many of those as we can. Um, so now, uh, for those of you who have been on any WordStream webinars before, you know this is my favorite part. I get to introduce my very good friend, Mark. Mark is our senior data scientist here at WordStream. Um, he's had more than five years uh, experience in paid search, um, and he has recently been voted the fifth most influential PPC expert of 2017. Um, the sky's a legend. You guys could not be in better hands for uh, today's material. Uh, he knows AdWords like the back of his hands, and we're very lucky to have him. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass things off to Mark. Thanks, Michelle. And Michelle, we were just having a conversation while we were waiting for the broadcast to start. It's been a while since I've done one of these, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's been a couple of months since I've done one of these. And I'm going to touch on like what, why I've been a little absent from the scene a little bit later in the webinar. It's definitely part, actually, it has a very close association with one of our major updates. Um, but in the meantime, we're talking about some major updates that are coming out this time of the year, uh, in the past month or so. So AdWords generally is really good about making updates throughout the course of the year. But man, just in time, just in time for the holiday season, here we are, um, the second day of Hanukkah, the Christmas is within about two weeks from today, and there's so much stuff just still coming out of AdWords today. So rather than just diving into individual things of what you should optimize on or what all of this is or talk about everything that's going on, I just want to quickly get together and talk about uh, the seven most important things that we should be focusing on that's new in AdWords. Um, so with that, want to just open this up with something that every single advertiser can benefit from. And this big change is called ad variations. And so ad variations, as you can probably assume from the name of it, it's just a way in which we control our ads and what kind of copy exists in our ads. So we're all too familiar with the idea that we're likely in our paid search accounts, we're likely going to create an ad for our keyword. So if I'm trying to sell Red Sox tickets, and I'm probably going to do that because I'm, you know, a Boston boy, tried and true. Um, hey, I'm going to create this paid search ad, this expanded text ad. I've got a headline, a second headline, some description text, and I'm going to do my best to create this head, uh, this ad for that keyword. But within the ad group, it's very reasonable that I'm going to try different call to actions in this, and I might create a second ad. So rather than just saying Boston Red Sox tickets, I might create this second he this other headline in here or this other ad with a slightly different message for people who are more concerned about uh, the cheapest Red Sox tickets or who are very price sensitive. So I might create a slightly different message for people who are looking for that and A-B test coming against that. Or it might be a best practice for me to test maybe three ads in this. Um, here this ad highlights uh, the find Red Sox tickets now, book online and catch the dame. Uh, someone who is looking for Red Sox tickets today or Red Sox tickets um, immediately might be a little bit more sensitive to different messages than someone who's very price sensitive or someone who's looking for group tickets or something along those lines. So it's very reasonable that just on this one keyword, I might want to test multiple different messages to reach multiple different audiences or different 
types of people who are sens sensible to different uh, call to actions, or just generally A-B test my account. And that's absolutely a best practice. We know that's the best practice. Um, what we see is just by testing more ads within an ad group, very often we see an increased click-through rate. So I did this research earlier this year. Um, I believe this was in August. But just looking across, you know, 18,000 accounts, looking at the number of ETAs in each ad group, we see that people who are actively testing more, testing different messages, testing different call to actions, testing different offers, different promotions, different sales, um, having those different messages allows Google to serve these ads better to people who might be looking for a slightly different offer, a slightly different deal, or a slightly different product. And so generally we see that ad groups with more ETAs, ad groups with three or four ETAs, have a 21% higher click-through rate than ad groups that only have one ETA. And that makes sense. We know that this is a best practice and we see that in the data. However, you know, this is something that is easier said than done. So looking at the number of people who create multiple ETAs in each ad group, well, that is a fairly laborsome process that creating ads is not just something that like, oh, I check a box and I just create an ad, right? I have to go through and I have to write 30 characters in this headline one, 30 characters in this headline two, 80 characters in this description text, and then rinse and repeat that multiple times per ad group. And that is a laborsome task and it is certainly not something that like we all woke up today and got really excited about doing necessarily. Um, that we didn't all get into this industry because we like to write short 140 character ads. And so unfortunately, what we see is even though we know it's the best practice, we're not seeing it all that common practice anymore. So about half of all advertisers aren't actively testing multiple ads in each ad group. And that's pretty problematic when we think about that earlier slide that we know that people who are testing more do better. And very similarly, more than three quarters of all advertisers aren't testing enough ads to necessarily be successful. So a very small percentage of advertisers have found the time necessary to go in and create multiple ads and manage multiple ads at scale like this across ad groups. And so that in itself poses a large problem. In 2017, 2017 is the first year that there are fewer ads in each ad account than there were the year prior. So for years and years, um, advertisers have been creating more and more ads for their ad groups. In 2017, we're not seeing people find the time. There's so much stuff going on in AdWords. We're all so busy. We're not just doing AdWords, but we're doing Bing and we're doing Facebook. It's very understandable that time is a limitation if I'm trying to manage um, multiple networks and you know, there's only one of me and God knows I have more more things to do than just create 140 character ads all day long. So where the new improvement, the new ad variation comes in, is this is going to allow me to go through this process to change my ad messaging without necessarily having to create a brand new ad itself. And so I can just go into AdWords and I can choose to just change one element of that ad. So this is pretty important if I just want to test a slightly different call to action or if I just want to test a slightly different headline or want to change that path field or that description field, but still keep everything else in my ad fairly similar. Well, now I can go in and I can do this. And I remember that like when I was managing accounts very directly during the holiday seasons, You've got so many sales, you've got so many promo codes, you've got so much stuff going on during the holiday season that just going in and updating these ads every day or every week, it was a pain because making that one change in a promo code or in a sales offer, that, that literally meant that you had to refresh every single ad in your account. We can now use ad variations to quickly update the messaging in our ads. So if I just want to change this headline to in this case, I can go in here and I can just specify that change in headline two. Or instead of updating the text, I could use find and replace um, to replace certain messages with new, new messages. So if I want to find um, Red Sox tickets and replace them with um, 
baseball tickets or something like that. I could go in, I could make that change, and I could test how those two messages work against each other. Or if I just want to go in and find and replace um, a promo code and update it with the current promo code, then I can go in and do that really quickly. This also enables me to do a lot of quick A-B testing. Um, so if I want to swap headlines one and two, obviously Google shows these headlines slightly differently across different devices, across different users. Um, it might be worthwhile for me just to test my ads with those headline swaps. It's a very easy test to run in ad variations rather than having to go in and create brand new ads from scratch. So all of this effectively allows me to change all the ads in my account or within selected campaigns at once. And so this saves me so many steps in just managing my ads. Um, whereas previously this was a game where I would have to go in, I'd have to write a brand new ad and type this out every single time or take this into Excel and change things and then re-upload them and then post them and then at the end of the day still wait for um, them to go through an approval process. This is something I can do nearly immediately across all the ads in my account. So this is something that I know um, my team has found very useful, particularly throughout the holiday season, uh, that they don't need to spend as much time managing semantics of ad copy. They can honestly just use ad variations to quickly make these changes into their account. And so not only is this great for just managing your account, making sure that you're testing more things, following that best practice of you know, always be testing, but also this enables us a lot more control in how we test. So I know that um, I would always say that when I was going in, I was creating an ad copy test, when I was creating an A-B test, I'd want to run it for 30 days or 60 days or something like that. And hypothetically, I would have created that, launched those ads, and then gone back in on day 31 and evaluated them. But as we all know, sometimes 30 days later, you forget, and then that ad copy runs too long or is no longer relevant or, or that kind of ruins the test because it now ran too long. Um, this allows me to specifically schedule start and stop dates for this. So if I know that I have sales coming up, I can easily start and stop these variations. Or if I know that I only want to run an ad copy test for the month of December or for Q1, I can go in and I can specify like when I want to run that ad copy test. I can also choose how often I want these variants to run. And so a big uh, pushback as Google begins to automate things like ad rotation, as Google begins to automate things like how your ads show on different devices, a lot of people have the feedback that their ads don't necessarily run in a 50, in a AB test 50-50 split that when you leave it up to Google, Google is going to serve the ad it thinks is going to perform better more frequently. And then some people get uncomfortable with the fact that Google is kind of predetermining the winner of that and serving it more frequently. Using this tool, we have control over what that split runs. So if I want this ad variation to run 50 um, I can set that up under the experiment split. If I want to test this to be a 30-30-30, 33-30-30-33 uh, percent split, I can go and I can set that up. I have that control over how many people see this copy. Or if I don't feel that confident in it and I just want to test it very small, I can also choose to run this very small. I can run this on 10% of my traffic and then Google will make that split on exactly 10% of my traffic. And so best part about all of this is after I set up the, the experiment, well, then I'm going to get the results from this experiment in a very clean reporting format. And it's not only just going to show me, hey, this is your original test. Here's its impressions, its clicks, its click through rate, its conversions, its conversion rate, all of those numbers. Here are the variants and all of their numbers to compare. But it will also include, um, and this is probably exciting only to me as a data scientist, but it will also include um, a, a statistical significance calculator and a st standard deviations uh, calculator in there as well. So if I'm very interested in knowing for certain that this performance is statistically significant, well, it will tell me what a 95% confidence interval of that looks like. So um, at, at risk of going down that big stats hole that some of us love and some of us are already bored with this conversation, this is going to tell me for certain whether or not this 
ad copy is truly outperforming the other or whether or not it's within a margin of error and might require more testing. So this is not only just going to make ad copy testing easier and faster, but the way we measure it is also a lot more easy and a lot more easy to explain to clients. I remember, I'm gonna go down, down the statistical for one second. I remember when I was uh, first starting off when I was fresh out of college and I was explaining to my clients um, the statistical significance of their tests. I would show the mean and I'd show the standard deviation. I would calculate that. And what uh, C-level marketing execs really don't wanna hear is they don't wanna hear about a student's teeth test for significance. Um, this saves us that, that process and just gives us that 95% confidence interval right out the bat that should be digestible for clients if they're so interested in seeing it. So ad variations, it's universal. It's available to all advertisers. It's within the new AdWords, uh, the new AdWords user interface. And I highly encourage you testing it out this holiday season as you're playing around with different ad copy. Now the second big thing, and of course for the holiday season, promotion extensions. Promotion extensions are also universally available within the new AdWords UI. And so promotion extensions, um, like many other extensions, they're going to show alongside our paid search ads, and they're specifically going to allow us to highlight sales and discounts on our site. So here on the right-hand side, we see this 20% uh, off women's shoes promotion extension running with this ad. So it's got that nice price tag that really sticks out on the surf, draws your attention to the fact that this advertiser specifically has a sale. So if you've got a sale and your competition doesn't have one, um, this is a really nice way to kind of get that visual impact right on the surf. Takes up a good amount of space on the surf too. And it specifically allows you to detail what that, what that sale looks like on what products, and if there's an offer code or a promotion date, or if this is for the holidays, it allows us to specifically um, run during those holidays or during that promotion date. So if I have a sale and it's only for the next couple of days, I can highlight that in my ad. If it ends on Monday, we can run this uh, promotion extension. And then at the end of the sale, this promotion extension will just stop showing automatically. So again, I don't even need to go in and update my ad copy when I have a sale now. I can use my promotion extensions to do that a lot for me. And it's particularly important this time of the year, uh, particularly as we talk about people doing a lot of holiday sales or Christmas sales. Um, we can specifically get that Christmas language in here. Very similarly, we see the, the ad in the corner here. It includes the occasion for Father's Day, but we could set up uh, the, the extension to include Christmas in here. Or for our Canadian friends, we could include Boxing Day. Or for anyone else, we could include New Year's after the holiday um, to continue to promote sales as they're appropriate for us. And they'll run during the, the holidays themselves, up to the holidays, and a little past if, if it's a promotion that extends past that uh, date. But we can use this to highlight the fact that, hey, we've got this sale, it's specifically for Christmas, it's specifically for New Year's, it's specifically for Boxing Day, however you want to highlight this, um, you're welcome to do so. If this sale is just evergreen and is not going to go away, then maybe we don't highlight it and we just uh, have this be a generic sale, but it's really great for drawing attention, differentiating yourself based off of what you have going on in your site. So we all do sales. We know that sales are a great way to drive new sales. Um, this is a great way to just take up more space and really hammer that down in your paid search ad itself. And so the great thing about promotion extensions is of course, like, yes, they're visually appealing, but we see that just very simply, they're very impactful in paid search accounts as well. When we look at ads with promotion extensions, I was really surprised when we were testing this out originally. Um, on average, promotion extensions, ads with promotion extensions have a three times higher click-through rate than ads without it. And so this is, I mean, Michelle can speak a lot to this, but I always really hate saying like something is double or something is three times as high as something else, um, unless it is. But this is literally across dozens of accounts, they averaged a three times higher click-through rate. And that meant that like some of them had six or seven times click-through rate um, than necessarily the ad itself. It's 
genuinely a very effective extension in people's accounts. And I think that a lot of this comes into the fact that it differentiates you from your competition, it's more visual on the SERP, and the fact that like including those promotion dates does create that sense of urgency. It does create that fear of missing out, that if they know the fact that this sale ends on Monday, then they can't necessarily just click on this and then walk away from it. They either have to click on this and convert, click, uh, convert soon or miss the sale altogether. So there's a lot that can be said about them, but it's also worth noting the fact that promotion extensions, like all ad extensions, both increase click-through rates, but they also increase your quality score. So we know that extensions have a factor in quality score. They help improve our quality score. And quality score helps us improve our position on the SERP, as well as reduce what we pay per click. So even if we don't have all that exciting an extent, all that exciting a promotion, it still can be enough to make our paid search ads just perform better on the SERP itself and have Google charge us less per click with a higher quality score. So there's a lot of good things I can say about promotion extensions. I'm really excited about them. I know that they sound like they're limited to just like e-commerce or retail people, but I guarantee you that regardless of what, what industry you're in, um, there, there are promotions that you do throughout the course of, course of your book of business. WordStream itself is not a retail company, but I'm sure that at the end of this webinar, Michelle has a number of promotions that she's gonna share with you. And so there's a lot that you can do um, just by using promotion extensions, regardless of your vertical. Now the third one is more retail based. Um, these are our shopping showcase ads. And they're again, new in the, AdWord, in the new AdWords UI. And so if you're familiar with shopping ads, Shopping ads have existed for a number of years on Google. Google's found a lot of success and a lot of our advertisers have found a lot of success on them. But they allow us to highlight uh, specific products to people who are searching for terms highly related to your specific products. So here on the right, we see someone searching for Reebok running shoes. And then at the very top, we see above the paid search ads, we see a number of these pictures and price points of running shoes. And those are all ads. Um, you click on them, they charge you a cost per click, they send you to the website. And this is slightly different than Google's new product. So this, the shopping ads will only run for people who are searching for a very specific branded item or a very specific uh, product. Instead, Google's shopping showcase ads will show for things like summer dresses here. And that's a very broad search that isn't necessarily a branded search, but it's people who are looking to learn more about summer dresses and people who sell summer dresses. And what we see is when someone does this search, they're shown a number of different products here. They're scrolling on this ad and expand of those, those dresses if they're so inclined to go to the website for it. And so the shopping showcase, when they first, so when they make these showcase ads completely free, so with this click to expand into this catalog, no money. You're only going to be charged if someone clicks in your catalog or if someone browses your accounts. And so 10 seconds to just be looking at a couple of pictures on, on their phone or on their desktop of something that they're not that familiar with. So this is an opportunity for us to get a lot of free exposure searching through a small catalog, really are interested in our product. When we compare the two types of shopping ads, because we're searching for people who are specifically top of file, people who are not searching for branded terms, um, we see that shopping showcase ads do have a lower click-through rate, that they have to click not only on the shopping, on the original ad on the SERP, but then they have to expand that into a catalog and then click on one of the products after that. So we see that they have about half the click-through rate but we also see the fact that these terms are generally terms that paid search advertisers stay away from advertising on. Advertising for the term summer dresses is very expensive or a very high, high volume search. So consequently, showing up for these types of searches is also about half as much money. So it is a lower cost, uh, click the rates, but it's also a lower cost per click. So this is a very interesting way for us to reach a different audience altogether. 
our traditional shopping ads are generally going to be people who are familiar with our brand or familiar with our product and specifically know what they're looking to buy. Someone who is running, uh, sorry, someone who is searching for Reebok running shoes is specifically looking to buy Reebok running shoes. Whereas someone who is searching for summer dresses is probably just beginning to browse around. How you engage those different searchers is a completely different strategy because they've got different levels of intent. And this new format allows us to reach those two audiences a little bit differently. So I can now use shopping showcase ads to kind of find my high funnel searchers, people who might not have a lot of intent, inform them largely for free, and then only pay to engage with them when they're very engaged with my product, and then use my product ads to push them further down the funnel. So hopefully we can use both ad formats strategically to target different types of searchers. And so this is gonna play a lot into, you know, your Christmas and your Hanukkah and your holiday shopping strategies um, that, hey, I'm gonna be honest, right now I'm searching for a lot of things for people that I'm not all that familiar with that brand or that product. If I wanna buy something for my sister, uh, if I wanted to buy my sister a dress for, for Christmas, then I'm, you know, a 28 year old gay man and I know nothing about that. So I'm going to do a lot of searches without brand or without anything. I'm going to have to kind of figure this one out and shopping show if ads can capture me slightly differently than someone who specifically is going in and searching for a very specific dress. I wish I knew a brand name or something helpful to say here in this example, but um, you know that idea. So up next, again, a very e-commerce specific example, uh, Gmail dynamic remarketing. So Gmail ads have been around for, I want to say like three years or so. And Gmail ads are a very easy, very effective way to reach people when they're actively not searching for you. So we all know paid search is great. Paid search is going to get us people who are actively searching for us. So they're looking for our product, our service, our brand, um, we serve them a paid search ad right there when they're looking for us. It's very easy to reach people on search. Um, Gmail is a very great way to reach the same people when they're not searching for you, which is most of the time. And Gmail it happens to be the largest email service provider in the United States, so it's got a large reach into the number of people it could potentially reach here. And we can use Gmail ads. We could target people according to keywords, based off of either what they've searched for in the past or what, they, um, what the context of their e existing emails, or we could reach them via different audiences. Um, we could reach them via things like custom ads, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We could reach them based off of their in-market audiences, um, based off of their affinities, based off of their demographics. Um, and we could reach them off of their remarketing audiences as well. However, at the end of the day, I would always be serving everyone the same ad that if you came to my site and you were looking at that particular one dress or that particular pair of shoes i would just give you a generic ad to come back to my site and look at my sale or look at my shoes but not specifically based off of what you're looking at this new type of targeting opens up that opportunity this di gmail dynamic remarketing allows me to specifically follow up with an email or follow up with a Gmail that includes that specific products you were just looking at on my site. I think that my sister would look at my sister the, the next day and in a very polite way, try and figure out exactly what size this is. This honestly might take me a day or two to, I'm ready to buy. So it was potentially dynamic remarketing my Gmail allows you to specifically include those dresses or those shoes or those products I was just looking at on your site. So not just remind me, you can stop for the fact that, or that I've previously bought these items or something specific um, so that we can really reach me based off of advertisers complete their purchases. The fifth thing that's new is customer match targeting by phone number and by address. And so the, I know this is a lengthy title, of course, but customer match targeting. Um, customer match targeting, it's about two years old now. Google released this uh, two years ago. It allows us to target our ads to our existing customers, assuming that we have their email addresses. And so we can reach them um, when they're searching, when they're in Gmail, um, when they're on YouTube, 
anywhere really Google lives, we can go in and we can have our ads just show to these people who are our existing customers or our existing leads. And so this is a really great way to either re-engage our existing customers or keep our existing leads or prospects, the people who we have email addresses for, we can serve them ads slightly differently or we can bid slightly differently for them. So uh, for instance, I am an Expedia customer. I'm pretty active whenever I travel. I travel, I book through Expedia. Of course, they have my email address so that they can send me um, my reservation details and that's my login and all of that stuff. They have my email list, of course. I get a lot of email marketing from them. But I also see that whenever I go and I do a search for um, when I'm traveling somewhere or if I'm looking for uh, Vegas hotels or something like that, I will always see an ad for Expedia at the top of the page. And that's not necessarily because Expedia is bidding more for everyone. It's probably just that they're bidding a lot more for me because they keep seeing the fact that I'm a loyal customer that continues to buy from them. So anytime I'm doing any search for travel, they want to show up at the top of Google specifically for me. And they might be willing to pay more or target me a little bit more aggressively than someone who isn't a customer of theirs. And so that's been a strategy that a lot of people have used for years. And so what Google does is it looks through these emails in a customer list and it tries to match this up to user information that they have on their end. And we see that Google's match rate is actually fairly competitive, that Google's customer match targeting, it matches about 50% of all people that we potentially up upload a list to. So if I had a list of 10,000 emails, I could likely target 5,000 of those users. Um, and we see that's more competitive than Facebook or Twitter, that this is honestly fairly robust as is, just by using their emails. What this change does, though, is whereas we previously may have had this list of emails of our customers, this also now allows us to target people based off of a list of phone numbers or a list of their addresses. So if I had um, CRM data that included phone numbers, or if I had a CRM data that included an address, or if I had uh, text message data or phone log data or direct mail data, um, if I'm running these types of campaigns, I could use the same kinds of lists within my Google campaigns as well. And what that's going to do when we give Google more information, well, that's going to improve the rate at which it could potentially match these users out. That simply having additional information. Maybe an email address isn't able to match us to an individual user, but it's, we have information for that phone number. If that's an Android phone number, then it's a really easy way to match that back to a particular user. Or if we have someone who has that same address um, as a Gmail account, well then that's a very easy way for Google to go in the back and match that information from an advertiser to a user that they already can identify. So this is a very easy way to improve that targeting, but it also allows us to expand the number of people that we could potentially target. That we see that we don't necessarily need to have all of their emails or all of their phone numbers or all of their addresses, that in some cases, just by having one of those pieces of information, we can still target them. So if I am not running an email marketing campaign, but I am running a text message campaign, or I'm doing some phone campaigns, or I'm doing a direct mail campaign, I could use this information to target my ads to them directly on Google. And that's going to allow me to uh, keep my prospects in my funnel, make sure that when they're searching on Google for my service, that they continue to see my ad and they continue to be reminded of me. But it's also a great way to keep uh, your loyal customers, to retain them and keep them loyal. So this is a really great way for us to expand our existing customer marketing efforts. The sixth big thing, custom intent audiences. And so on the Google Display Network, um, for a number of years, since 2013, man, I'm really dating myself with that statistic. But since 2013, advertisers could target users who were in market for pre-selected 439 products or services on the display network. So if I were in market for um, 
dating services, for instance, I see here, I could potentially reach people who were looking for that uh, specific product. And that would be really great. But within this 430, uh, 493 products, that is not everything that all advertisers might be looking to sell. And so with that, Google introduced custom intent audiences. And this allows us to use that same kind of in-market audiences behavior, the types of things that people are searching for or looking to buy, and reach them based off of that interest. And Google gives us a couple of options in terms of how we want to apply this to our campaigns. Google will automatically create these intent audiences for us if we want them to. So Google will analyze the keywords that are already in our search campaigns and then just apply those to our display campaigns, make that a lot easier. Um, it will read our website, it will get that kind of inference of like, what is our website about? What are we trying to target people about? What is our general service? And try and create an intent audience for that. Or if you're doing something really niche, um, we sell paid search solutions. And that is not something that like Google included in their 493 intent audiences. If I want to go in and I want to specifically write in my own keywords that I want Google to target based off of, or my own URLs I want Google to target people off of, I could go and I could create that custom intent audience for my specific product or service. This is also really interesting because I could use this potentially to, if I wanted to target um, people who are really active on my competitors' websites, I could include a custom intent audience around people who are visiting all of these other websites. And then I could target my ads to them based off of the fact that they were interested in those websites. And I could reach them even if they've never been to my website before. So this is not a uh, remarkable Remarketing, this is kind of that next step beyond remarketing. People who have not yet been to your site, but are very interested in your product or service. And finally, uh, life event targeting. So I mentioned at the beginning of this, I've been gone for a couple of months, um, and, and a lot of this actually plays close to heart uh, in this sense. Google released life event targeting here. And what life event targeting allows us to do is it allows uh, people who are advertising on Gmail or within YouTube to target people based off of major life events. So these major life events that they released are people who have graduated college, uh, about to graduate college, uh, get married, recently got married, um, or planning to move or recently move. So those are some major life events. Um, it's very easy for Google to determine when someone is about to move. If I suddenly were in Boston, I'm doing these searches in Boston, I start searching for uh, apartments in LA and a U-Haul and all of this stuff that, that Google could fairly easily see the fact that like I'm probably planning to move to LA or something like that. And it could put me in this in-market audience, sorry, this life event audience of people who are looking to move. Um, given that, as an advertiser, I might be interested in targeting those people based off the fact that they're looking to move. There are a lot of easy implications for that, that if I were moving services, if I were U-Haul, I'd be very interested in finding those people who are planning to move. Or if I were a, a local gym or a local dentist, then people who recently moved might also be a very important audience for me, knowing the fact that you recently moved, you're very likely looking for these kinds of local services that you're unfamiliar with in your new place. Um, so there's a lot of implications for this, but um, I know this very personally. I recently got married, and that's where I've been for the past uh, couple couple of months. I took some some time off to, of course, plan a wedding and get married, and you know, also some time off. Uh, but man, uh, getting married taught me exactly two things. Um, and the first and most important is that I, I'm very happy to have found my wonderful husband who puts up with me. And I don't know how he does that in, his, in itself, but it's uh, just so happy about all of that. Um, but the second thing that getting married has taught me is that getting married is really expensive. And you end up buying a lot of stuff that you would never otherwise end up looking for. So never in my life will I probably spend
spend as much time looking for a caterer or a DJ or for bridesmaids dresses or for a florist or for a D oh my god just so many things like planning a honeymoon all of this stuff is stuff that like I'm out there I'm spending money I'm spending a lot of time on search I'm spending a whole lot of time on Gmail on YouTube talking about this stuff looking for this stuff I'm very prone to making decisions um about things that I generally don't know much about just because I'm getting married to this guy and so I recently got married. I got married at the very end of September. And then even after getting married, now that I'm in that recently married stage, I, I thought it would all be over, to be honest. But there's still more and more stuff that all of a sudden need to buy. I still need to buy thank you cards. I still need to go out. I need to, like, now comes the nesting part that if I were looking to buy a house, this would be a time that I would likely be looking to buy a house. I had to, I recently just got health insurance as a couple rather than as a lone wolf. Um, uh, retirement planning is a thing that I, words have never come out of my mouth before, but now that I'm married, life insurance, that becomes a thing that I have to plan for. Um, hypothetically, I would also, this would be when I would start looking to plan a family. I'm definitely not there yet, but like for me, looking to get a dog, um, after getting married, that all of a sudden getting married, it's a huge life event and that you begin planning things slightly differently in the days leading up to it, but as well as the, the days afterwards. And knowing that, knowing that it's such a dynamic time in some individual's life and that they're looking for so much, it poses a very strong opportunity for advertisers to target people based off of these life events. And it's uh, true across multiple life events, across uh, graduating college or getting married or moving. And so think about as you're looking to plan your 2018, how these life events, how people experiencing these life events might be particularly interesting to your product or service. And so with that, now that I've gotten out the fact that I got married and bragged about that for a little bit, um, Michelle, I believe you have a couple of offers for our loyal viewers. Yes, absolutely. So Mark kind of hinted at a couple things of, of reviewing your account. Um, you know, the year is wrapping up. So we have a special offer for those of you who are on the line today. Um, so if you're interested in getting an account audit uh, from one of our AdWords certified consultants, um, they can review your account performance this year, uh, help give you some guidelines for 2018. This is um, uh, a representative from one of our, our team members here at WordStream with um, strong backgrounds in AdWords. Uh, so definitely, if you'd like that, go ahead and click um, and you can sign up for it right there. Um, and while you all are deciding on that, I will get to some of the questions that came in. Um, so Mark, one question um, might be difficult to answer, but uh, someone on the call today uh, has heard of a lot of advertisers boosting their AdWords budgets um, before they're really seeing an increase in their revenue. Um, do you think that this is a smart strategy? Do you think this is something that um, advertisers on the call should should mimic? Or what are your feelings on that? That's a very, like, broad, broad question. And I think that what this boils down to, if I were to answer it, I think that everything that you're doing in AdWords Scratch that. Everything you're doing in marketing should have some kind of goal to it. So if you are just looking to get out there, get more exposure, then absolutely, money gets you exposure. Um, but I think that a more important thing is if you're unhappy with the performance of your account right now, then throwing more money at it, you're just going to do more of the same. You're going to be similarly unhappy, but now you have less money. Um, so I think that at different points, it's very important to understand whether or not you're looking to refine what you're doing and improve the performance which you already have. So do you want to get better at targeting your existing users? Do you want to get better at targeting your ads or writing more ads? Or do you want to go out there and expand what you're doing? Are you happy with what's going on and you want to do more of it? At which point then I'd say like, hey, yeah, absolutely invest more money in this. I've never been a big proponent of like, spend as much money in AdWords or spend as much money in Facebook as you can because it will all be worth it in the end. Because sometimes I see the fact that more money does not mean better results. 
I see a lot of people be more successful, oftentimes by spending less money, but by improving their targeting. And I think that a lot of the things that are improving their ads or improving their quality score, something like that. And I see that um, a lot of these, these new things specifically are catered around refining your targeting or refining your ad or managing that a lot more effectively than necessarily just like going out and doing the next big thing. Right. I knew that was a loaded question. Well answered. Thank you. <laughs> um, this question is a little bit more specific. Um, so it is in regards to the promotions extension. Mm -hmm. So if you're using that feature, uh, this per person wants to know, do you need to display a promotion code to use it or? Yeah. Nope. Uh, so if this is something that it's, let's say it's 20% off everything on your site, you don't need to drop a code on it. Um, I think that the, some of these examples have a promotion code in it. And that just so that if there is a promotion code, you can highlight it. But that's an optional field. Uh, very similarly, if there's not like a promotion date, some people run like fake evergreen sales. Like I have a client that runs 25% off, but they run it 24 7, 365 days a year. That it's just like a fake kind of like price point that they then march down to be this evergreen sale. Um, and they're still eligible to use this promotion extension. Uh, so really it's versatile to what your, your needs are or what your niche is. If they have to like spend $50 to be eligible for this or $100 to be eligible for this, you can also include that in the promotion extension itself. So it's a fairly versatile extension. Awesome. Another pretty specific question. Um, this has to do with um, Gmail ad targeting. Mm -hmm. So do you think this is applicable for B2B marketing as well? Or is, it, is it applicable to corporate Gmails as well as personal Gmails? So it's not, um, yeah, that is a very uh, specific question. Okay, so the dynamic remarketing, it's going to require some kind of feed to run that. So if this is B2B, I mean, I recently bought a bunch of B2B products um, that were still products that had a price point and we got a physical item here. Um, and those would still be very eligible to serve. And this, you will see that depending on um, the app that they use to engage on this or the, the web service that you use to engage on this, this does expand just beyond Gmail, but it does include Gmail powered um, things. So for instance, the, the at WordStream email that we use here, that's a Gmail email that is, or it's powered on the, the Google platform. Um, consequently, we pay for the premium, like no ads version of it. You wouldn't be able to reach us on that. So please don't try. But um, <laughs> You could potentially, if there was a, a lot of smart, a lot of startups, a lot of people who have the, these Gmails do have ads within their, their corporate emails as well. My previous agency still had ads in their previous Gmails under the, the promotions tab. So you could still reach people, even if they don't have that at Gmail signature, that they could still be powered via a Gmail account that still has ads there. Awesome. Okay, we've got time for just one more question here, um, and it's a doozy. So you listed seven of the top updates. Which do you think should take priority, if any? Um, ooh, that is a doozy. <laughs> I think, again, this is going to come down to like what your business is and what your goal is. I think that I started with ad variations because I do genuinely believe that everyone should be doing ad testing, and simultaneously with that, having done ad testing, I do believe it's laborsome. Um, I avoided saying something right there. I'm very proud of myself. But um, it's laborsome and it, it can be time consuming and no one gets excited about doing it. Uh, I think that ad variations is a very easy way for us to like focus on doing ad testing without necessarily spending a whole lot of time doing ad testing. Apart from that, I think that if I had to pick a second one, I think that the next biggest one for me would be uh, the customer match expansion, that this gives us a lot of opportunities to engage a very important audience to us, and that's our existing customer base. Awesome. Again, well answered, Mark. <laughs> okay, so that just about does it for the time that we have today. Um, 
like I mentioned at the start of today's webinar, head to our website, wordstream.com. We've got lots of resources for you all. We've got some free tools like our AdWords Performance Grader. Definitely worth a run if you haven't already done so. It takes about a minute and it gives you um, a full comprehensive report based on your specific AdWords account. It's really, really great. So you can check that out on our website. Um, also, you had the opportunity here um, for an account audit from one of our AdWords certified consultants. Even if you selected no, if you panic, change your mind uh, after the webinar, you can feel free to email us um, and we can definitely get you set up with one of those. Um, so thank you all for joining us today and thank you to my friend Mark for sharing all of his insight. Um, and we hope to see you guys on a future WordStream webinar. Thank you guys.